Good morning, everybody. So glad that you're here. Um, I am a, I, I'm really excited about our topic of today. Today is week five of our series, Why God? And so hopefully this has been a good series for you. Of course, if you've missed uh, some of these, uh, we are on iTunes. If you'll go to www.thewoodbridgechurch.com. Uh, of course, you can pick up on anything that we've missed. Let's pray. Father, we need you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and speak into our hearts today and teach us your word and teach us what you want us to hear and what you want us to know about you. And uh, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so, um, why God? We've talked a lot of... Uh, a lot of theology, a lot of apologetics so far, why we can trust the Bible, why we need God, why we would choose God above anything else. And today, uh, I, I'm coming from a, a different angle of why God. Why do I need God in my life? Why is, why is God worth serving, doing things that are uncomfortable, uh, coming to church when, you know, Sunday's my one day off? Why? Why would I do this God thing? So a little bit different angle today. I want to teach you about the Holy Spirit because I believe that you should choose God. And I believe that God is more important than any other choice that, uh, or any other option that exists. And uh, we, we seldom look at it from this angle. But as Christians, we believe that we have possessed or indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Now... There is some strange teaching, and a lot of people, according to your background, uh, are, are either unfamiliar with the Holy Spirit or confused about the Holy Spirit. And so many of us see this as like God's strange cousin, the Holy Spirit. Because let's face it, we've seen some really strange things happen. Anybody ever lived a period of your point? where you didn't identify as a Christian, or maybe you did, but you separated yourself from the Christians, and there was just a certain aspect of, there's something weird going on there. And every time something weird happened, you heard the same name, right? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So, so there, there, there's a lot of confusion. We need, to, we need to dive into this today. But I believe that you should choose God, because God sends you His Holy Spirit. And we say all the time, God will never leave you, He will never forsake you. And for many of us who are, are we're, we're living life and we're out in the world and we're going, Okay, God, where are you? And we believe that He is right here with you. And so maybe this will be uh, eye-opening for many of us today. First of all, we've got to start with just a little bit of a lesson. I'm going to breeze through this. When you came in the door, you got a connection card. Maybe take down some notes. Uh, because this is something you could go in and study later on. If you have a Bible, obviously that's where you should go. Uh, it, for online, you can find any opinion, any view online that you would like. So it's hard to trust, right? But uh, if you'll go to BibleGateway.com or BibleHub.com, you'll be able to look up topics and it'll just take you to where the Bible talks about that topic. So those are good tools to use and you can use this. But first we have to start with a word and it's a word you've heard before but it is a word that is not written in the Bible and we believe it still. It's called Trinity. Okay, Trinity meaning like three, right? So we use this not only for God, there's a trinity of, of other things as well. But we believe that God puts himself out there to us in a trinity, right? And there's three. Three in one. Now, we call those God the Father, God the Son. God the Son, who do we call him? Jesus. Man, you guys are good. It's going to be a breeze. And God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you've heard different things. Holy Spirit, Holy Phantom, Holy Ghost. The, same thing. Okay, so when people say Holy Spirit and some say Holy Ghost, we're, we're, we're talking the same thing. Okay, so this is the Trinity. So we know that there is God and, and He puts Himself out there to us in three different ways. I know that this is like mind-blowing and we could get so deep into this, but I'll let you research that on your own. And so we believe this. Now there's one God. There are not three gods. Uh, they are all the same. 
but God chooses to put himself out there in this way. Remember that God is not constrained by time, space, or matter. He created them. Okay? So he's not, he's not constrained within them. He's not in the jar. He made the jar. Alright? Now, so when did he do this? So like he created man and then decided to like show himself to us in three different ways? No, as far as, 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 far as we know, this is... Uh, an eternal thing that God has done. I'll show you what I mean. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Chapter 1 is the first chapter. If you guys don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. Please, please take one. We have one. They're, they're right by the door as you come in or go out. Please take a Bible. We want you to take these home and, and make it part of your life to read these. If you're not familiar with the Bible and you're not good at thumbing through Scripture, don't worry, you're in good hands. We'll have all the scripture right here on the screen. And also, uh, we just want to say that the Bible is in two sections. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament says that God created the world, chose His people, and promised that one day a Messiah would come. And the New Testament is when Jesus, uh, who is the Messiah, came. And now this is where we step into the story, okay? So, first book, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. Wow! Anybody see an immediate problem in our image? Who's he talking to? Right? So the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, existed from the beginning. He's talking to himself. Wrap your mind around this. Okay. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the livestock, all the wild animals of the earth, and small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Okay? So, uh, so the Trinity has always been, therefore the Holy Spirit has always been. Now, where was the Holy Spirit in the past? Just a quick history lesson on this. This is going to clear some things up for some people. And if you don't know any of this... Good, it's geared for you too, okay? So, the Holy Spirit. So, all the way back in the beginning of the Bible, right? God chooses His people and, and He does uh, send His Holy Spirit, but it wasn't the same as it is today. So, in fact, I have a little diagram up here. Uh, they would build a temple in the Old Testament. And so, uh, you know, you could go around the temple and you could go into the portico, the porch of the temple... And then there was a holy place in the temple that you couldn't always go into. And then there was this place in yellow here that we would call the most holy place. Or some would call it the holy of holies. And that is where the Holy Spirit dwelt. Okay, So the Holy Spirit was on the earth, but He dwelt in the most holy place. And only one man, only one time a year, could go into the most holy place. Because that is where the Holy Spirit was. And if you went in and you were unworthy, you would die okay so he wasn't completely confound there and could never leave but we know that was the dwelling place of the holy spirit now the people would sometimes experience the power of the holy spirit i'll just give you one example and that's in judges chapter 14 verse 5 this is an example of samson many of you have heard the story about the man who was really strong he wasn't strong on his own accord okay Check this out. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord, Holy Spirit, came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat, but he didn't tell his father or mother about it. I think people were a lot stronger back then. Does that strike anybody? It's as easy as tearing apart a young goat. <laughs> Never tried to tear a young goat apart. Granted. Doesn't sound easy. Okay. But anyway, so the Holy Spirit would come uh, on people, but then He would leave. Now this is all Old Testament, okay? And then you come into the New Testament, and, and, and we, we find Jesus comes onto the scene, right? So He's the one that changes everything. So this is God. God the Son came down. He was born of a woman, so He was fully human. But He had no father. Mary was a virgin when she was conceived with Jesus. So now He is fully God. He is fully human. So God has come to man, and we call Him Jesus. This is the Son of God, okay? Now, check out, uh, check out Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. 
It's talking about Jesus. He just got baptized. He never baptized anyone, but he did get baptized. Matthew 3.16, After his baptism, as Jesus came out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. This is an interesting passage, because you have God the Father speaking. This is my Son. Right? You have... God the Son, Jesus, who just got baptized, and you have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. You have all three at the same time, at the same place, right here. Okay? So, uh, the Trinity is not some far-fetched thing. This is, boom, right here. They're all three in one place at one time. Okay? So, this is Jesus' baptism. Now, you know the story of Jesus. Uh, after his baptism, obviously, he went and changed the world. He had a ministry for three years, and then he was crucified. Now, when he died, check out this account in Luke chapter 23, verse 44. Now, I told you guys earlier that the Holy Spirit was in the Holy of Holies, in the most holy place. What I didn't tell you was what separated the holy place from the most holy place was a curtain. Okay? So keep that in mind. So, Luke chapter 23, 40, 44. By... Uh, Jesus has just died on the cross. It says, By this time it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. So this is the death of Jesus. And so that curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place is torn down the middle. It is rent in two, right, from top to bottom. What's the significance in top to bottom? This thing's like 40 foot tall. Nobody can reach that, right? God tore it. The cat's out of the bag. The Holy Spirit is out. This is a big difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Holy Spirit is no longer just in the Holy of Holies. He's no longer just in the most holy place. Now... The temple has been torn apart. It's been desecrated. The Holy Spirit is out because there is a new temple. Now, if you are in here and you believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins and you accept that, you are the new temple. And inside of you is the most holy place. Somebody say, I'm holy. Doesn't that feel weird? Like, actually, I'm a little dirty. <laughs> Been thinking about re rebaptizing myself here because we feel very dirty, right? But remember, He paid for your sins. He cleanses your sins. And we talked last week. That doesn't mean I have a license to do whatever I want to do. If that is your desire, we need to rethink this accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior thing, right? But if I have trusted in Christ, I am a walking temple of the most holy God, I have been made holy. Alright? So, who lives in the most holy place? Good. The Holy Spirit. Where is the most holy place? Everybody do this. The Holy Spirit is still in the most holy place. There's just a new temple. You're it. Pretty cool, huh? Why God? Because God is in me. What can I not do? I digress. Let's keep going. Okay. Now, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Uh, this is Jesus. He dies on the cross. He comes back to life. And then he appears to over 500 people at one time. And he appears to his apostles, the 12. Now he's speaking with them here and he says, It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good. Okay. So, three in one. The Trinity is one God. He chooses to show Himself to us in three different ways. Now, 1 Corinthians 6.19, this is just going to uh, go with what I said earlier. Uh, this is what Paul writes to the church in 
uh, Corinth, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. You are the most holy temple. Treat it that way. Okay? Young ladies, your body is not to give to someone else. Young men, your body is not to give to someone else. Old ladies, old men, all of us, right? We are a holy temple. Yes, we've made mistakes, but God has cleansed us of that. And now we try to live worthy of like being the container, right, for... Uh, for the Holy Spirit. He's in us. We don't want to defile the temple. So, we want to live a life that is worthy. Now, this is kind of the history of, and so this, this gives you just fragments, but it puts together who the Holy Spirit is and, and what's going on. And then, we have to jump into Acts. Now, this is a plug for our life groups. We're going through the book of Acts and our life groups. Really, really encourage you to jump in if you've never been. All it is is a Bible study in people's houses, and they feed you. It's awesome. Okay, Not intimidating at all. I don't care. If you just got done working out, come out. If, if you're at, at all inclined to join in a life group, please fill that out on that connection card. It will, uh, we'll get you plugged into one. So, now, in the book of Acts, and this is where things get fuzzy and people start building like their own religion on stuff, okay? When you read the book of Acts, one thing that you have to understand is the book of Acts is the history of the church, okay? We will never again start the church, all right? So the book of Acts is not prescription for your life, and this is how it should go when you do this. The book of Acts is a description of what happened when they did that. Does that make sense? So we have a lot to glean from and a lot to learn from. And we learn about God and how He works and why He does what He does. But just because it happened that way for them doesn't mean it will necessarily happen that way for you. I believe that we are following God best we can. Uh, now in the book of Acts, thousands were being uh, joined into the church daily. We've not seen that yet. Okay, That doesn't mean we're doing it wrong. Right? It's just a description. It's not necessarily a prescription. All right. Now, check it out. Acts chapter 2. This is when the church is born. Jesus has gone back to the right hand of the Father, and we're in charge. That's scary. But here we go. On the day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost was just a festival. It was a Jewish festival. Okay? It was a one-day festival because it's right in the middle of harvest. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on them. So, they're having their Bible study, right? Wait, they hadn't written the Bible yet. Not the New Testament anyway. So they're, they're all together and they're worshiping God. And then like it sounds like a mighty rushing wind. And tongues of fire come and settle on them. This was a big deal. This was, this was very interesting. And I'll tell you what happened theologically here. What has just happened is, is monumental. Because remember in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come. And you could rip a lion apart like just as easy as ripping a goat, right? But then the Holy Spirit would leave. Now the Holy Spirit has come and He has done what? Settled. Because we are the new temple. We are now the dwelling place. So now the Holy Spirit doesn't just come and leave us. He comes and stays with us. I'll get to this later, but Jesus said, It's good that I go, because when I go, I will send you a comforter. And the comforter, the advocate, is the Holy Spirit. And He stays with us. Okay? Now, I'm going to go here, and it may be foolish, but everybody's asking the same question right now. So might as well address it. So, Pastor, is tongues for real? You know you were asking it. Let's just go ahead and dive into the Scripture. Okay? Now, how do I know 
If the Holy Spirit's speaking through me or that's someone else, or what about somebody else? I've heard people speak in tongues. And I don't know if that's real or not. I, I'm, I'm just confused on this. My opinion does not matter on this. Let's jump into the Scripture. I will say that there are some topics in the Bible that are like, ah, this is hard. This is, you know, there's a couple things. I could see this going a couple different ways, you know, as I compare Scripture. Tongues is easy. Tongues is easy. It's written about so, so clearly and, and so descriptively. It's really not a hard topic. So I'll point you to the Scripture. Read them for yourself. But uh, it, it's, it's really clear cut. Now, does it exist? Absolutely. It's written about right here. Yes. The gifts from the Holy Spirit still exist today. I can find no evidence in the Bible that the gifts of the Holy Spirit don't exist anymore. In fact... I believe that I have gifts from the Holy Spirit. I have the gift of prophecy. I've even seen visions. My wife has the gift of wisdom. She's even had dreams. We believe that those things came from the Holy Spirit. Okay? However, I personally have never spoken in tongues. I also personally have never seen anyone ever scripturally speak in tongues. I have friends that I trust greatly, and they have seen it. Okay? I have not. The Bible's so clear about it. But uh, one thing I will admit to you, well, here, here's the deal. And I think what raises the question is, uh, in our community, there's, there, there, there are some that will tell you, you are not a Christian until you've spoken in tongues. And they'll tell you this. This is, this is a popular teaching in this area for some reason. Uh, and, and I do not at all uh, agree with that. But I am going to give you this. In the book of Acts, most of the people who became believers spoke in tongues. So I totally see where they're getting that. But there's some scripture that we're going to throw out, and, and I'll tell you why I don't believe that it is necessary. Is it possible? Does it still happen today? Sure, absolutely. Pastor, what, ha what would happen if someone in here spoke in tongues? If biblically someone in here spoke in tongues and it was interpreted according to the scripture, do we be praising God? That's awesome. Right? We're never going to reject the movement of the Holy Spirit. Okay? I'm just making that clear right now. But, check this out. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts. But the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service. But we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. Verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Okay? And this is where we go wrong with spiritual gifts. Why, why does it say that we are given spiritual gifts? It's not so that you can look awesome. It's not. It's not for you. It is so that you can help others. Okay? And if you disagree with me, I, I, I'm just reading it. Verse 8, to one person the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives a great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another Spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. See, there it is. It's still there. Right there. It's for us. The gifts of the Spirit are for us. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. We don't all have the same gifting from the Holy Spirit. It's so clear in Scripture. Okay? Um, <clears throat> check out verse 29 of the same chapter. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in an unknown language? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. Pretty self-explanatory. Okay. So if someone has told you that you're not a Christian because you're not speaking in tongues, I do not believe that that is scriptural. Okay. Now if you do... Praise God. Do it according to the, the Word of God. And I will say that 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 
you might want to write that down, so clearly lays out the gifts of the Spirit and what tongues really are that there's just really not a lot of debate to be had. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that's really the easiest to study in all of Scripture. Okay? So, ta-da! There you have it. Okay? We talked about tongues. Now, I will say, when you are looking into the Holy Spirit, because there's so much just wild teaching out there, uh, one thing I advise you to do is what we would call rightly divide the word of truth. I check Scripture with Scripture. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.15 Work hard so you can present yourselves to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker. One who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. So in other versions, this would say uh, be, be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? I would highly encourage you not to pick out one section of Scripture, take it out of context, and build a whole religion or denomination on it. It happens a lot. Okay? So read everything in its entirety. And so if I find one thing, and I go, oh, wow, I didn't know the Bible said this, but in ten other places it contradicts that, it's probably I have a lack of understanding on the one thing. Does that make sense? Rightly divide the word of truth. Correctly handle the word of truth. Listen to teaching. Sure. Read books. Absolutely. But always hold the word of God superior over anyone's teaching. Okay? Uh, ask for confirmation. So the question is, how do I know? And this is, this is many of you have asked this question. How do I know if it's like, if it's God, if it's like, if it's the Holy Spirit trying to work in me and do something in me, or if it's just my harebrained idea? Because this is wild. Okay? Well, firstly, rightly divide the word of Scripture, the, 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 the word of truth. So you know, I really think that God is telling me to leave my wife and go marry another woman. That is contrary to Scripture. God is not telling you that, okay? So just check Scripture with Scripture. I think the Holy Spirit is really telling me that I'm, I'm supposed to, you know, pull over the next car on the highway and just punch the person out. That is not from God. Okay? So a lot of people do things in the name of God, but, right? I mean, I mentioned this the other day. Hitler, he manipulated some Scripture to motivate his people, right? Took it out of context. He got it all wrong. He did not rightly divide the word of truth. Secondly, I would say ask for confirmation. Because, again, why should I choose God? Because we have the Holy Spirit. So, here's where we get into it. This is where I get all jacked up. If you wonder, if you're having problems, you have a helper. Okay? If you need some help, you've got an advocate with the Father. If I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do next, I have the Holy Spirit to guide and direct and lead me. That's a reason why I think you should choose God. That's a reason why I think you should try to live holy, because the Holy Spirit will guide you into truth. He will guide you into a better life. Ask for confirmation. We just read about Jesus being baptized. John the Baptist was looking for confirmation. Is this the Messiah? Okay, I just saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove. Gotcha. Confirmation. Right? There's confirmation for, for so many things because you're not going to look up. There, you don't open the Bible and say, okay, book of Jason, second chapter, where should I go to college? Right? It's not there. God, what do I need to do? God, help me, right? I begin to look through Scripture. God has obviously called us to serve Him. Okay, how do I do this? And I believe that the Holy Spirit will give you confirmation. All right? Now, so, cool. So what exactly is the Holy Spirit supposed to do in my life? I'm glad you asked. Let's breeze through this at a foolishly quick pace. But here's what the Holy Spirit does. Does This is why I think you should be a believer in Jesus. This is why I think you should submit to the will of God so that the Holy Spirit can control and take over and uh, be in charge of your life. Okay? Here it is. The Holy Spirit is a comforter, helper, teacher. John chapter 14, verse 26. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I cannot explain or tell 
How many times I've been in a situation and I say, I have no words for this. And I just begin to pray and it just flows out of me. I've, I've counseled with people I've even preached and it's almost an out-of-body experience and I'm going, this is good stuff. I didn't even know this. And the Holy Spirit is just using me. He's just pouring out, right? Because He teaches. He, he, he comforts. He, he's my helper. Alright? Acts uh, chapter 1 verse 8. We find out that the Holy Spirit empowers but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You say, you know what, Pastor? You're like, hey, let's go change the world. And I'm just not powerful enough to do that. I know. Which is why you should do it. Because we need more people in the ministry. We need more people serving God that know that they can't do it on their own. And it's got to be something bigger. In fact, I'm going to get there in a minute. But that's kind of how you know the Holy Spirit speaking is when you know you can't do it. The Holy Spirit generally isn't calling you into something that you can already do on your own. God left to be at the right hand of the Father and sent us the Holy Spirit why? Because we couldn't do it without Him. So if you got a vision and you're like, this is impossible, now we're getting started. Okay, the Holy Spirit is an interceder. Check out Romans 8.26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. As you pray... The Holy Spirit is taking your prayer up to the Father. This begs a question. What's He taking to the Father? Like if I play, if I, if, if I sit down at lunch and pray in my southern accent, Oh, Heavenly Father, we uh, want to ask that you bless the lunch as we crunch it and uh, we... Uh, uh, nourishment of our bodies and other words that I don't use in everyday language but I say to thee, amen right, did the Holy Spirit take anything to the Father did anything come out of your heart did you desire, request, ask or long for anything right, but when we long when we when we want, when we need I mean he's got something I wonder sometimes if our prayers even make it to the Father, Holy Spirit's going okay what's the desire of his heart I got nothing out of that. <laughs> it's just me wondering. Maybe that's not the way it works. The Holy Spirit is a guide. John chapter 16, verse 12 through 15. There's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own, but will tell you what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever He receives from me. All that belongs to me, uh, all that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever He receives from me. If you are truly seeking the truth, the Holy Spirit will guide you. Say, but there's all these different teachings, there's all these different denominations, don't focus on that. Get to God. This is how you do it. Not, not from your indoctrination. Not from this is what my parents believed. Not from any of those things. Holy Spirit, guide me. And He'll read to you. He will read to you. Quick story and then, and, and then we, we, we've got to finish. But uh, I turned my life to Christ at a, at a fairly young age. I was about 17 years old. And I began to read my Bible. And the Bible that I had was a King James Version of the Bible. Which is still a great version of the Bible. It was written in the year 1611 under the authority of King James. So a lot of the language is like, like you don't get it, you know. Uh, if a lot of our internationals here tried to tried to read, uh, you know, some of some of the King James, it'd be like, I don't know what these words mean because it was it'll say like Jesus said, "Verily, verily, I say unto thee." Anybody here know what "verily" means? Like <laughs> we don't know, right? But at 17 years old, I began to read the King James Version of the Bible. I remember sitting in senior English one day, and we were reading Shakespeare, and somebody said, I can't stand Shakespeare. It sounds like the King James Version of the Bible. It has all those these and thous. I said, the Bible doesn't have these and thous. 
And by this point, I'd read most of, of the Bible. I mean, I was just enamored with it and reading it. And, and, and I opened up the Bible, and for the first time, I saw it. I had never seen any of the strange language. Why? The Holy Spirit was reading to me because He knew that I needed it. When you seek God, He will guide you into the truth. If you'll seek God above seek, seeking being right, if it's not all about being right and it's truly about getting to the Father, the Holy Spirit will guide you. So, why God? Because He will comfort, help, teach, empower, intercede for you, and guide you into the truth. Heaven, yeah, that's, that's why I would choose God. I want to populate heaven. But here on this earth, could you use a little help? Somebody say amen. Could you use a little help here on this earth? Yes! So, why God? Because the Holy Spirit will help you. Because you have a comfort that will come. Okay, Pastor, but here's the big question. Here's the biggie. Then why isn't he helping? Let me ask it this way. I need this. I'm going to get some feedback. <laughs> Let me ask it this way. So why... Yo, hold on, I got isn't that annoying? Why don't I see the Holy Spirit? Because this is all you see! Right? Do people ever... Oh, yeah, yeah, y'all hold on one second. See, I've got my watch, so I cheat sometimes. I'm like dictating things onto my watch, and you don't know it, right? But I do the same thing, and I totally get it. But God desires time with us. We have the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us, and we have all of Him. The Holy Spirit has a personality. The Bible says He can be grieved. In other words, you can tick Him off. You have all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. But the question is, how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? Why don't I see the Holy Spirit moving? Why would He move through you? Why don't I hear the Holy Spirit speaking? And the real question is, why don't I listen? <laughs> Pastor, the Holy Spirit's speaking. How do I listen? Now we've got the right question. Because He's still moving. My wife and I can stand up here and tell you for hours story about, stories about how we've seen God move, how we've seen the Holy Spirit move. And it's like, this is supposed to be in the Bible. This isn't supposed to really happen. And then I get so enamored in being a pastor and, and, and doing the, the church thing. And, oh, we got to set out chairs so there's no time to pray. we got to, you know what I'm saying? Right? We do the exact same thing in life. And Satan's going, if I can't make you evil, I'll just make you busy. Because if I can keep you from hearing from your Creator, if I can keep you from getting a word from the Holy Spirit, you are no threat to me. You want to know God better? Spend time with God. You want to trust God more? Start following God. You want to do something great? Do something scary. Everybody wants to see God save the day but nobody wants to need to be saved. Everybody wants to hear God speak, but nobody wants to listen. And the question is this, why would God give you a message? Would you hear it? Would you do anything with it? Autumn, go ahead and, and, and you're ready. Okay, you're already there. Last thought. And then we're going to have a baptism this morning. Hallelujah. Ben, you guys go ahead and come up. Last thought. God has called us to ranger. Not us like a few of us. Us like us. God has called us to ranger. Why? He has a message that He wants you to carry out. America used to be a nation of spreading the message of the gospel, but as we began to pimp out ministry to the professionals, it began to dwindle because everybody didn't carry a priesthood within themselves. If you are in here today and you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in here, in here, in here, 
And he is there so that he can help you. Help you do what? Get through my day. No! So that he can help you populate heaven. So that he can help you bring people to Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit so he can help you. If you're not doing anything that needs help, if you're not doing anything bigger than you, if you're not doing anything for God, you won't see Him move. But my desire is that you are dying as an old woman, as an old man one day, and people can't wait to get to you to write down your story. Because they've seen God move in you. Can it happen? Every single person in here will be used by God if you will submit to Him and listen. Why God? Because the Holy Spirit. You want to do something like you've never seen before? You've got to listen like you've never listened before. Autumn, go ahead and come up. We have Autumn today. Many of you uh, know her, and she has been a fantastic help. If I move up, I may get some feedback. Chris, sorry about that. But um, Autumn comes today, and she says that she has been following Christ for a little while now, and we know that she has. She's been doing a fantastic job. I'm going to unplug this so you don't die. I think it's unplugged in the back, but I'm not certain. Good, yes. It is. It is. See? Holy Spirit. Okay, so, Autumn is obviously serving God because she's alive. And, and she comes and says that she's ready to make it public. She's ready for, for you guys to know that she has dedicated her life to the Father. So, uh, Autumn, I'm going to ask you, and hopefully everybody can uh, hear this, but Autumn, have you committed your life to Jesus, accepted Him as your Lord and Savior? Okay. You guys hear that? This is her profession of faith. Autumn's family is here with us. We're so honored that, that you're here with us today. But Autumn... Does this water save you? No, the water doesn't save her. This is just a symbol that she has died with Christ in His death, that she is raised with Christ. She is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and she is His to follow. Amen? So, Autumn, it is my honor and privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Him in death, raised to walk in newness of life, 